Welcome to another episode of the Libertarian Christian Podcast, a project of the Libertarian Christian Institute. I'm your host, Doug Stewart. And as you can see, if you're watching, uh, I have Cody Cook with me, and we are going to go over problem passages for libertarian Christians. And by problem passages, I mean Bible passages that allegedly means you can't be a libertarian or can't be against the state or anarchist or, you know, all the different reasons why Christians, either conservative or progressive, are going to say, well, you can't be a libertarian because, well, what about this first? So we're we're going to talk about that, Cody, and uh, we're actually going to do this in several parts. Um, but the first one we're going to do is the passage, Render Unto Caesar. Now, this is uh, a very um, common, it's a common passage or phrase that's, that's used, I think, because people want to split oh, I can have my allegiance to God and I can have my allegiance to Caesar, uh, to Caesar. or I can just, you know, have a split way of viewing the world. Uh, separation of church and state is, I, when I was in college, I took a class on Baptist distinctives, and that was one of the core verses for separation of church and state. And uh, I just kind of accepted it. And, and while I still believe in separation of church and state, uh, I don't really go to this passage necessarily for that. So anyway, we're going to talk about these passages. Um, and so I hope listeners will tune in or whatever you do when you dial in, tap on, subscribe, whatever, watch the three episodes or listen to them, of course. Uh, why do you think Render Under Caesar is a, is a passage that is uh, problematic for libertarians, potentially? Well, yeah, I don't think it is actually. Yeah, but, but the, the, the common reading of it is that it's, it's understood to, um, I, I, I guess it's one of those passages that gets appealed to for like a split person, like kind of a split personality mm -hmm. <laughs> understanding of Christians, that on one hand, we do have an allegiance to God, but we also have this allegiance to Caesar. That um, that there's a domain that's God's domain, and also a domain that Caesar's domain, and that they're separate. Mm. And um, and I think when when you say that very explicitly, um, it, it sounds kind of heretical. But but usually, what people will sort of say is, well, you know, Jesus said we should give to Caesar what belongs to him. And so, and then there's an assumption about what that means, right? And they 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 kind of they don't really explain what belongs to Caesar. They just sort of kind of have this assumption that there is this domain, this realm, that Caesar's realms. It's not God's mm. realms. It's a realm. It's Caesar's realm. Yeah. And I think if you push them on that, they'd say, well, I guess it is God's realm too. But, um, but the, the, their reading kind of implies that there's sort of two, two, two places and, and, you know, the twain shall not meet. Mm. Um, so that, that's, that's what makes it a problematic passage. Um, well, a potentially problematic passage or an allegedly problematic passage. For well, it's a problem because we have to actually have an episode on it. I mean, it, is, right. it does pose a genuine, you know, like we're not going to be reading the you know Psalm 23 and be like, look, you can't be a libertarian because of Psalm 23. So, um, I mean, I don't know. I haven't thought about it that way, but that was just yeah. a random passage that doesn't seem any threat to, sure. you know, it's about pastures yeah. and stuff. So, yeah. But we're going to read the text. I think that's one of the other important things that I want to do in these episodes is we're going to read the text so it's not just like we're referring to this text that we think that the listener has some familiarity with, although most of these people are. But it's also important to actually read these in either, you know, either um, translations that they're not familiar with. Cody, you you read it. You and Alex Bernardo both read from the New American Standard Bible. Um, and I, I read from different Bibles and, and you know, we all as we're studying, we pick up a bunch of translations right. um, and maybe even consult some Greek depending on depending on what you're actually doing. Uh, but in any case, um, <clears throat> why don't why don't we get into reading the passage unless you have anything you want to say before we dive in? Yeah, no, I, I don't know. In this case, I don't think the translation matters that much. I think I some of my notes I jotted down were using the NASB. Um, and uh, generally speaking, what I've noticed is that scholars who are more conservative like the NASB, scholars who are more liberal, godless heathens, um, prefer <laughs> the NRSV. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm just kidding. Yeah, we but, do. Um, but, they're, but, they're, but those tend to be the two <laughs> that are used the most in scholarly circles. There's Got the NRSV it. and NASB. Yeah. And, yeah. So anyway. I, I brought a few with me, and only in part because I can show these on screen uh, for those watching, um, and because they're sort of my... If, 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 if there's like an alt translation universe, this is, these are like my three top ones uh, for, for New Testament. And that is, uh, we've got Scott McKnight's, uh, it's just called the Second Testament, which is a follow-up to the, guess what? The First Testament, which was not translated by him, but uh, by John Golden Gay, uh, which I also have, but we're not talking about those because those don't pose a problem to libertarianism, I don't think. Um, no, we're just not talking about those passages right now. Um, and then I have the David Bentley Hart New Testament translation. This is the first edition because he got it wrong. He made another one, I guess. I don't know. He did a second one that just came out. And yeah. then 
actually my favorite translation. The New Testament for Everyone, translated by uh, Tom Wright, N.T. Wright. Um, and uh, yeah, so we might consult those. Who knows? Right. Um, but well, uh, yeah. Well, while, we're talk, while we're making book recommendations, I was going to mention that this passage we're talking about, I have an essay on in a book I wrote called What Belongs to Caesar?, um, so if you're listening to this podcast for free, you don't have to buy the book because we're going over the same material right now. Oh, and if you actually want a copy of the digital book, you can become an LCI insider, which you can find out at libertarianchristians.com slash insiders. Uh, and in a very soon month, we're going to give that out as the free ebook for, for our LCI insiders. So now that you've said that, I should say it's only one essay in the book and there's other great essays that are also in the book. There we so go. An LCI insider would, would definitely be interested in getting a, getting a hold of it. <laughs> All right, let's re- let uh, you want me, you want me to read the whole passage at once. It's up to you. Um, we could go through kind of a couple of ver- a verse or two at a time, maybe, and then just kind of follow the the, the, the logic of it if you like. Yeah. Well, I, I what I'll do is I'm gonna I'm gonna read it. I see you've got it all here. This makes I just have to skip through your notes. Uh, I'm gonna read it because the guy on the elliptical machine at the gym or driving might want to just hear the passage, Great. and uh, we'll we'll just do that. So it's it's Matthew. If someone is following along at home, it's Matthew 22, 15 through twenty two. All right. Everybody, turn there. Oh wait, we're not in church. All right. Then the Pharisees went and plotted together how they might trap him, Jesus, in what he said. And they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians saying, Teacher, we know that you are truthful and teach the way of God in truth and defer to no one, for you are not partial to any. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to give a poll tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their malice and said, Why are you testing me, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the poll tax. And they brought him a denarius. And he said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? They said to him, sorry, he said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? They said back to him, it's Caesar's. Then he said to them, then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God, the things that are God's. Well, Cody, I I think we just need to pack up shop because this is just clear. It's very uh, straightforward in the text. Straight reading of this says, well, give the things that are Caesar's. Jesus just said here in this passage, there are things that are Caesar's or did he? Yep, things that are Caesar's that are not God's. <laughs> yeah, so... Um, <laughs> Very good point. <laughs> uh, verse 15, uh, we'll start there. Then the Pharisees went and plotted together how they might trap him in what he said. And so I, I, I think it's important to start here because Matthew's making a point here to say that the, the, the Pharisees are actually setting a trap. And so if we, if we understand that it's a trap, we're going to understand Jesus' response a little bit better. Um, Luke's version doesn't mention which party is involved. They just, he just mentions that it is a trap. Uh, Mark says it's a combination of the Pharisees and the Herodians, which is kind of interesting because the Her- Herodians supported the puppet king Herod, who worked under Rome's authority. Uh, but the Pharisees were more traditional and patriotic Judeans. They, they kind of claimed their lineage from the, uh, the Maccabees. And so it seems kind of odd that they'd work together to get Jesus in trouble. Um, But I think it does actually demonstrate how Jesus, how dangerous Jesus was to both of their interests. So like if you have sort of a third way Christianity viewpoint, uh, it's interesting to note that Jesus is both uh, being opposed by the um, the zealots, more more or less, uh, which maybe is a slight exaggeration of what the Pharisees were, but they were not really tight with Rome the way that the, uh, the Herodians and the Sadducees were. Um, and then on the other hand, you have the sort of, um, those who are collaborators, right? They support the puppet king and they support Rob. And so, um, I think just to, just really quickly, I'll just say that if you're a Christian, I think you should be, you should be somebody who neither one of those sides like. <laughs> um, and so I'll, I'll just mention that really quickly before I move on. So in any case, uh, we should note from the outset that the goal of the people who are interacting with Jesus is to trap them. Trap him rather, so we need to keep that in mind um, as we um, as we move forward. That the question that they're about to ask him is a trick question, and so as, as we're doing the exegesis here, you can break in anytime you want, Doug, and, and push Plug me if in. you want. Minute. So, verse sixteen, um, they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians, saying, "Teacher, we know that you are truthful and teach the way of God in truth, and defer to no one, for you are not partial to any." This just sound, sounds like such like sucking up to him a little bit, like yeah, warming, I was, warming him up in a way. Yeah, I was going to say, I know LCI is trying to reach a younger audience. They're rising up Jesus. And uh, so we, <laughs> uh, and, and Jesus catches it, right? So they're hoping to make Jesus think they're on his side by flattering him. I'm glad we didn't record this six months ago. I would have no idea what you were saying. 
So, um, so anyway, yeah, so they're trying to lull him into a false sense of his security. They're trying to take down his defenses. They don't really want this honest answer from a wise teacher. That's not, that's not their goal here. That's not what mm. they're trying to do. So they ask him, verse 17, tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to give a poll tax to Caesar or not? And so here's where we see their trap. The question assumes that there's a conflict between honoring the pagan Caesar who invaded God's land and the God who truly owned the land, right? So from a, from a Jewish perspective, especially one that's very focused on political hegemony and the land, the promise of the land, they, they think really, there's a serious conflict here that you have to resolve one way or the other. Mm-hmm. There's not really a middle path here. And so they think it's a binary choice and, and they're, they're going to get Jesus to do one thing or the other. He's either going to, they're either going to get him in trouble with the people who want Caesar gone, the patriotic Jews, and who aren't going to tolerate a traitor and they aren't going to follow him and, you know, go listen to him speak anywhere. Uh, or they're going to get him in trouble with Caesar's system because Caesar's not going to tolerate a rebel. So the moment that Jesus says, stop paying taxes to Caesar, he's really in trouble. And the moment he says, pay taxes to Caesar, he's in trouble with with another group of people, right? As if he needs to get into more trouble anyway. Yeah, and at at this point, though, the most of the the people tend to like him. It's the the leaders who who aren't liking him very much. But we'll see that, uh, uh, you know, elitism and populism both end up at the same place, and that's with uh, good people (laughs) crucified. But um, (laughs) anyway, verse 18. That's another uh, episode, right? Yeah, right, right. Jesus perceived their malice and said, why are you testing me, you hypocrites? So he gets it right away. Uh, despite their flattery, he's, he's not, uh, not going to be lulled into a false sense of security through that. Um, it's, it's kind of interesting. This is just kind of a little Greek that's kind of interesting here. Um, the word hypocrites is actually almost the same word in Greek, which is hypocritai, and it literally referred to an actor on the stage, though we can kind of see figuratively how it could be applied to anyone who pretends. Uh, it pretends to be something that they're not. So Jesus knows his interlocutors are false friends and that they aren't really truth seekers. So Jesus is onto their, onto their uh, plan and he does something that they don't expect. And what he does is he says, verse 19, show me the coin used for the poll tax. And they brought him a denarius. So the New Testament scholar Craig Keener gives us some background on this coin. He says that the coin used for the poll tax related directly to pagan Roman religion and to the imperial cult in the East. The side bearing his image also included a superscription that uh, could be translated as Tiberius Caesar, son of the divine Augustus. And the other side bore uh, a feminine image, uh, perhaps of the Empress Livia, personified as the goddess Roma, and read Pontiff Maximus, which refers to the high priest of the Roman religion, which Caesar also was. So the empire actively used such coins to promote the worship of the emperor. Uh, and um, Jews were, while, while Jews were actually allowed to honor emperors in some way, not like through worship, but they were mm-hmm. expected to, you know, show, yeah. show fidelity to some extent. They were expected to avoid images. So that's, that's going back to the Ten Commandments, when you have images like this, and especially when they have such a kind of a religious context of idolatry, um, a good Jew would have tried to avoid that image. So that's something to keep in mind. Jesus is yeah. catching them at something here. Well, I, I want to note something because this is a really good, th- this quote that you read from from uh, Craig Keener, uh, well, it's really quoting the things that were happening there. Tiberius Caesar, son of the divine Augustus. So it's one thing to say, well, the Bible can teach separation of church and state if, if Caesar was not, if Caesar were not a religious icon or if Caesar were not considered by the people or by his generals to be a god or a Mm -hmm. son of the gods or somebody worthy of allegiance or something. In other words, in this particular instance especially, Caesar was not just like this happens to be secular realm of government, right? Caesar allegedly, uh, according to Caesar, was a god. And so there was a direct conflict already. And so even if you want to, end up with a separation of church and state and say that there's this two things, this can't be the passage that you would go to because that's the nature of Caesar in this case. Right. The question is, what does Caesar think belongs to him? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> right. right. And, and, and there is absolutely Caesar's a making a claim. Yeah. Right. There, there's a huge conflict between what Caesar thinks belongs to him and what God thinks belongs to him. <laughs> right. <laughs> so uh, let's, keep, let's keep going. Verses 20 and 21. 
And he said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. Then he said to them, then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. So most readers are going to treat this passage as though when the Pharisees asked Jesus if Jews should pay taxes to Caesar, he had just answered with a simple, why, yes, <laughs> in which case he would have fallen for their trap. So, but that's not what he did. If he had, he would have fallen into the trap. Instead, he reframed the conversation. And this gets missed a lot because a lot of readers like, fail to ask the one very basic question of this text, which is, what belongs to Caesar? And then secondly, why does it belong to him? Mm. So is Jesus saying the coin belongs to Caesar because he made it and it bears his image? Or is he claiming that Caesar has a rightful power over the whole empire and everyone in it simply because he was strong enough to murder people and take over their lands? Is that really the claim that Jesus is making? And, and I, I think, you know, most contemporary readers are going to assume that Jesus is speaking about Caesar's political power and he's contrasting it with God's, you know, spiritual power. You know, God's mm -hmm. power is limited to the spiritual realm. He owns our spirit, but, you know, Caesar owns our body. And um, not to pick on our Lutheran friends, but some of that goes back to Luther where he sort of almost saw um, that humans, Christians in particular, were like two people. Right, so he said, "Well, when he's talking about the Sermon on the Mount, it's nonviolent prerogative uh, uh, imperatives." He says, "Well, yes, as a Christian, you can't, you know, you know, just kill innocent people, but as a soldier, you can because you're two different people." And 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 so mm. that's like this kind of reading of Scripture where we are not sort of whole beings that belong to God. Part of us belongs to God, and part of us belongs to Caesar. And um, R. T. France is a New Testament scholar. Um, I think ultimately agrees with something like this. He says that what belongs to Caesar is in this context primarily the monetary obligation of the poll tax, though Jesus' words are broad enough to permit a more expansive understanding of civic responsibility as well. Uh, but the second member of the pronouncement, the what belongs to God, or in Greek, and the of God to God, <laughs> is entirely open-ended and must be filled out by the reader's understanding of God's claim on his people. It will be that understanding which determines whether the claims of Caesar and of God come into conflict, but the way the pronouncement is formulated suggests that such conflict should be expected to be exceptional rather than normal. So France basically says, yes, there are things that belong to Caesar. There's also some things that belong to God, but you know, we kind of have to you know, work through that on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, it's a little bit unclear, uh, but ultimately that there really shouldn't be any common conflict between these two areas that it should be more or less clear. But I think that Keener does a much better job here. He focuses on what Jesus is explicitly talking about, which is the coin. So he writes that the, uh, quote, the emperor controlled the production of the coins. They were officially his property, um, end quote. So the translation render also might obscure what he's, what's being said here because in Greek it means give back. So Jesus doesn't, we, I think we just sort of think give to Caesar, but it's give mm. back to Caesar. The coin belongs to Caesar. He minted it. He introduced it into circulation with the condition that there would be a usage fee, a tax, to be returned for its use. So Jesus is not saying to give to Caesar whatever Caesar asks. He's also not saying that Caesar has a special domain in which to do what he pleases that God can't touch. So the point that Jesus is making is as simple as this. That coin belongs to Caesar. If he asks for it, give it back. So instead of Jesus making the point, <clears throat> excuse me, that Caesar or the state which he represents can lay claim to your life or the lives of others whenever he pleases, or, or your property for that matter, he's actually making a point about private property and the right to contract. So Caesar's property belongs to Caesar. He can set the conditions for when you can use it. It's a, it's a usage fee. It's interest. So Jesus' answer here really has no direct bearing on whether the government could, for example, tax your produce or your cryptocurrency, uh, <laughs> but really basically your use of its own currency. Uh, while France mentions a domain that belongs to God, he doesn't go into much discussion of what this domain is and where the board borders are between it and Caesar's domain. Um, but Jesus tells us to give to God what belongs to him. So we have to ask the question, what is that? And there are at least three answers that could be given. So there's the kind of Lutheran, uh, contemporary Christian, evangelical viewpoint, I would say, which is that it's your spiritual side. So this suggests that God is only interested in your religious devotion, but not the rest of your life, because that more or less belongs to Caesar. Um, in the book, I, um, I mentioned, um, there's a, a quote from um, Full Metal Jacket, um, 
where uh, uh, Arlie Ermey, the, the um, uh, drill sergeant, says something like, you know, your, your butt belongs to the Marines. Uh, it's sort of like that. You know, your, your soul belongs to God, but your butt belongs to Caesar. So that's one, one reading of, of what is God's. Okay. The other reading is that it's your whole self or really just all human beings. So the early church father, Tertullian, wrote, quote, render the image of Caesar, which is on the coin, to Caesar, and the image of God, which is imprinted on the person, to God. You give to Caesar only money, but to God, give yourself. And so if we're kind of saying, okay, there's this thing that's in the image of Caesar. What is it? Well, it's the coin. There's also this thing that's in the image of God. What is that? Well, it's us. <laughs> and so we don't actually belong to Caesar. We belong to God. And Augustine actually, because uh, Augustine tends to be a bad guy when we're sometimes from a libertarian perspective, um, but he agrees. He says, we are God's money. Uh, but we are like coins that have wandered away from the treasury. What was once stamped upon us has been worn down by our wandering. The one who restamps his image upon us is the one who first formed us. He himself seeks his own coin as Caesar sought his coin. It is in this sense that he says, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. To Caesar his coins, to God your very selves. And then the third view of what it is that belongs to God would be well, everything that exists. <laughs> so Psalm 24, for example, uh, reads that, uh, tells us that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and all those who dwell therein. Job 41.11 tells us uh, that God said, whatever is under the whole heaven is mine. So while God allows us to own private property, we have it essentially by his indulgence. He can take it or us whenever he pleases. Um, so, you know, as popular as the first solution is today that uh, their spiritual side belongs to God, I, I think it's the one that's least rooted in the text. Mm -hmm. It's also, I think, the most contradictory to Christian teaching generally. Um, solution two, I think, is better. Um, the one that it's, uh, that it's uh, uh, human beings specifically. Uh, it also has a good pedigree in the church fathers. Uh, but I think solution three is probably the most biblical because it, the idea that God owns everything, I think is, is I mean, certainly one you can, you can prove. So s somewhere between two and three, I think we're, we're looking yeah. at the right reading. The reading that tends to be invoked against us as if it's the only logical reading of the text, I think is the worst reading of the text. Yeah. It's the least biblical yeah. and the least sensical. Yeah. I, you know, I, I'm looking at these on our notes here and I, I think I'm more attracted to number two. Let me tell right. you why. And it, or I should say it this way, number three, everything, everything that exists belongs to God is a true statement. But as I say to the, whenever I teach like Sunday school or something at a church, I was like, okay, you know, you read with kids and you ask them a question, you read, let's say first John one, and you read, you read something and you're like, okay, so what is this saying? And they say things that are true, but not from this text, right? Because right. they're trying to either impress you or they're just not skilled at, at understanding. So in some ways, I would I would almost kind of appeal to that mentality of like, well, okay, so based on this text, um, and, and for the same reason you kind of pointed out that Keener kind of sticks with the whole like coin situation. Right. If Jesus didn't bring up something about the image of Caesar on a coin, I'd probably say number three is kind of a slam dunk, right? And that we could still interpret it this way. But I would say... From this passage in particular, it's probably a matter of Jesus identifying with the, uh, or sorry, identifying the you're in made in, you're made in God's image, right. uh, and Caesar's made this minted this coin in his image. So if he thinks that's his, give it to him. Uh, but you know, uh, you know, my fellow Jews, that this is that you are made in God's image, you know, because of Genesis one, etc. And so I would say that actually sticks closer to the text, even though three is technically true. Right. Um, I also am not really fond, and I'm not saying you're necessarily doing this, and if you are, okay, fine. Uh, <laughs> but I'm not really fond of reading in contract law and Lockean type stuff into the scriptures, um, unless it's just clear that there's really no conflict. I'm not sure anywhere in the scriptures is trying to establish anything like that. Yeah, that, that, that's an interesting point. So what I would say about that is, we have our kind of, you know, classical liberalism has its own take on this, but it's not as if contracts didn't exist or property rights didn't exist in the ancient world. True, true. They, they have notions of that. And the whole idea that something belongs to Caesar, so give it back. I think, you know, if we're just talking about, you know, wanting to develop a, um, a theology um, from the text, at the very least, um, I think, oh, I lost my train of thought there for a second. So. Um, <laughs> Um, so yeah, so 
the coin belongs to Caesar, so give it back to him. Now, does Caesar have other claims on you, perhaps? Well, you could maybe try to appeal to other biblical passages for that. But here, all it's talking about is the coin. <laughs> and so yeah. I, I think that the, claim, the, the point that Caesar minted the coin, and he also gives the conditions for its usage, um, you know, I, 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 I understand what you're saying. I'm certainly not trying to read in, you know, libertarian, sure. um, you know, anarcho-capitalist principles into the text. But I think that even in the, its own context, not only is Jesus saying that, but there is a, a, a uh, an economic historical context for yeah. uh, contract and property. Well, and you could even go to 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 throw it back in partial agreement. At least the idea that Caesar owns the coin because he minted it and it's his. God, I don't like to say God owns us in that same way because again, I don't want to use the we're reading our word ownership and property back into mm -hmm. certain things. Uh, but God created us. Uh, but that is still a claim of of authority and sovereignty, right? And yeah. so Caesar like belonged to him, right? And Caesar's claim to sovereignty over over people is tied uh, pretty pretty tightly to the ability to tax them. And mm -hmm. so it's not like these are inseparable. So I'm not like rejecting option three here that you're that you're describing. Um, I'm just saying that like the the more slam dunk version is in my mind number two. Yeah, so door you. number two is me. No, we could disagree as long as we want, but yeah, um, no, yeah, yeah. I guess it, what I would say with three is I think three takes the fuller context of scripture into mind. But if you're just all you're doing is looking at this one passage, I think two is pretty pretty clearly the 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 you know at least yeah. the very least that we could say about it. Well, and both of them together just make one nearly impossible, or or I mean for us actually impossible, right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's yeah. they, not a part of us that belongs to so, Caesar. So their reaction was, they were like, oh, okay, let's all become libertarian Christians, right? <laughs> no, uh, so yeah, so verse 22, and hearing this, they were amazed and leaving him, they went away. And I actually like what Augustine says here. Caesar seeks his image, render it. God seeks his image, render it. Do not withhold from Caesar his coin. Do not keep from God his coin. To this, they could not think of anything to answer, for they had been sent to slander him. And they went back saying, no one could answer him. Why? Because he had shattered their teeth in their mouth. <laughs> uh, oh, you know, wow. of course, yes, of course, Jesus was nonviolent, so not literally, but. Yeah, right, 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 right. Um, oh, and, man. And, 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 and Keener adds something to this too that's kind of useful. Um, Jesus undoubtedly challenged the idea that his opponents needed to hold on to the coins at all. Why not return them to Caesar? Jerusalemites prefer death to allow, allowing Caesar's image to enter Jerusalem on military standards, according to uh, Josephus and Antiquities, uh, yet they carried it on coins. Uh, one would make such an exception for money only if money were of extreme importance. By contrast, surrendering to God, surrendering to God what is God's implied the surrender of all one was and possessed. Jesus has not compromised his popular support but rather embarrassed his challengers. They, not he, are carrying the offensive coins. So scruples against it cannot be their own. <laughs> End quote. So thus, I think we can conclude that whatever we may think about the state's purported divine right to exist or tax or kill, it can't be argued for on the basis of this passage that's not the intent of Jesus' yeah. words. Yeah. So there's a parallel passage. It's what, Matthew 17? Yeah, and I know we're 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 coming close on our, our yeah, time. Yeah, it's okay. I don't know if you want to summarize like the gist of it, and you know maybe we can come back to it another episode or or yeah. whatever, or we I, can even just add some of your notes in our show notes page or something like yeah. that. And, and, and I do discuss this in the book, which is going to be made available through uh, through LCI's um, uh, insiders uh, uh, membership. So, libertarianchristians dot com slash insiders. <laughs> so you can get that there as well. So yeah, Matthew seventeen. There's this really interesting story where uh, people come to Caesar and they're asking about the tax for the temple. And they say, does your teacher not pay the two drachma tax? And he said, yes. And then he immediately goes <laughs> to find Jesus. And he says, uh, you know, tells him, you know, hey, the, the, the people are asking about this. <laughs> and uh, Jesus says, what do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth collect customs or poll tax? From their sons or from strangers? And Peter says, from strangers. And Jesus said to him, then the sons are exempt. However, so that we do not offend them, go to the sea and throw in a hook and take the first fish that comes up. And when you open its mouth, you'll find a shekel. Take that and give it to them for you and me. Now, this is usually, I think, just kind of pa quick, uh, passed over quickly as this kind of weird miracle story. But there's a few things that I think stand out here that, that we should probably look at. So first of all, Jesus notes that taxation is inherently unfair, right? Because the people who are in power 
are always collecting it from people who are outside of their family. But the other thing, though, is that Jesus is actually exempt from the temple tax because he's the son of the temple's king. And mm-hmm. Peter is also a son of God in a lesser sense, and so are all Christians. So, so are we under the jurisdiction of God? Are we under the jurisdiction of Caesar? And you know, if God, then would we owe taxes to Caesar? So all these questions really kind of come mm. up um, as you're reading this text. And I think the idea that, you know, Jesus says, go and, you know, catch this fish and you'll find a shekel, I think points to the idea that probably, I think it is pointing to the idea, at least subtly, that God owns everything. (laughs) And that if we're his sons, then, you know, we are to inherit everything. Um, But ultimately, I I think one thing that we really need to get out of here is that despite, um, you know, various objections that we might have to paying taxes, the reason Jesus gives for paying the tax is not because it's fair or right for it to be collected, but to avoid causing offense. And that comes up a lot as we're reading some of these passages about how Christians are supposed to interact with the state. It's not that Caesar's owed this. It's not that we have any real moral obligation. It's that we're not trying to look make 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 our Lord look bad. Hmm. And so as, as Christians are sharing the gospel, they're not trying to pick fights with Caesar. And and so, you know, uh, there's, a, I can't remember who says it, maybe John Piper or something. Um, you know, the gospel is already offensive, so don't you be. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. So ultimately, I think that's something we really have to keep in mind as we're, as we're uh, thinking about our relationship to the state and why we should, you know, not necessarily be, even if we are sons of the, of the true king, we're not necessarily trying to start trouble or, or, or incite violent rebellion. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Man, I really love your insights. I like how you go through the text. Um, I, I think this has been a really helpful conversation and we're going to do this again um, in a, in a soon episode. Um, we'll, we'll follow up with the next episode, which will be about um, Romans 13, which is going to be even easier, right? <laughs> yeah. Romans 13 is a cinch. Yeah. I mean, it's just so clear, you know, (laughs) nobody needs to be subject to the governing authorities because you're all God's image. Wait, it doesn't say that. I guess we'll have to figure out how to interpret, how to interpret that. Cause, uh, option one, the statist option is probably not a good one. So anyway, well, thanks Cody for being with me on this one. And, uh, we'll, we'll be back again soon. And, uh, for those listening, libertarianchristians.com slash insiders. If you are able to please, uh, rate, subscribe, uh, subscribe to our show, rate it, write a review on, you know, whatever podcatcher you, whatever podcatcher you use that really actually helps get more visibility on our show. And of course, share it with somebody. Um, I'm, I can't imagine you don't have a Christian who, uh, a Christian friend who needs to hear this message, especially today's with, uh, about, you know, uh, render unto Caesar and render unto God and, and why they're wrong. I mean, everybody likes to hear why they're wrong about things. So go share this episode. All right. We'll see you next time.